Um, we have Mike Robinson, who is, of course, joint editor of the UK column. Um, Mike is also the techie guy and constantly surrounded by wires and keeping his cool when everything goes wrong. Uh, he has been researching since the mid-90s um, on everything to do with financial matters and constitutional uh, matters. So now he's going to address the attack on our constitution and um, big, give a big round of applause for Mike. Okay, I'm not going to talk too much about the Constitution itself today because, uh, well, other people have done that already, uh, not least John Bingley. And if anybody hasn't seen this film uh, on the British Constitution Group website, which is his talk from, I think, the second conference that we did, uh, then please watch it because he covers uh, pretty much all the various constitutional documents that we have, what it means for us, what our relationship is to the state. And, of course, that's what a constitution is. It's about describing our relationship with government and what government is. Uh, another book that I could recommend is this one. It's a bit, a bit heavier, it has to be said. The content is, uh, is significantly heavier, but if you're interested, have a look at that one. Now, um, I just wanted to say a quote uh, um, from uh, John Adams here, um, from what he said about uh, the way that we run our government. And of course, what I'm talking about here is how he saw it in the 18th century, um, and uh, it's not how it is today because we know that government is not working as it should be working. So when I'm talking about the Constitution and talking about the fact that we live in a constitutional monarchy, not a democracy, that's what it's supposed to be. In fact, we live in a dictatorship, as we already know. But anyway, Adams said, I can only contend that the English Constitution is, in theory, the most stupendous fabric of human invention, that the Americans ought to be applauded instead of censured for imitating it as far as they have, not the formation of languages, not the whole art of navigation and shipbuilding does more honour to the human understanding than this system of government. Um, so um, I think when government is working correctly, uh, when our government is working correctly, it works well. There have been times in history. We'll mention a couple of them where it has worked well. In general, it hasn't because, well, we, we know why. The cr corruption seems to creep in. And really, our, our government is viewed by many people as being tripartite. So we've got the monarchy, we've got uh, the parliament, we've got the judiciary. Actually, there's a fourth aspect of this, which, is, which Ian talked about and Brian talked about. It's really probably the most important thing, and that is accountability. And that's our responsibility collectively, everybody in this room, everybody in society. And if we don't hold the people with, that, that we give our sovereignty to, to look after, that if we don't hold them to account for that, then, then really we get the type of government that we deserve. Yeah. Right? So um, one of the uh, main excuses that constitutional reformists make for what they do is they say that we don't have a written constitution. Uh, by that, what they mean is that we don't have a constitution written down in a single document, and of course that's true. Uh, and it's very hard, because our constitution isn't written down in a single document like the American constitution is, it's very hard for, for us to, to really get to grips with what it represents. Um, but uh, in fact, there is a common thread uh, running through all uh, our major constitutional documents. And that's not a coincidence, because each constitutional document, whether it be Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, all these various documents that have been uh, written throughout history, um, they are restatements of something which is generally understood, the laws and customs of the land. Uh, and uh, so, for example, when Magna Carta was written and sealed on, in, at, at Runnymede, um, basically that, was, that, didn't, that didn't create our constitution. So you look at the various clauses in Magna Carta, that isn't the limit of the Constitution. It was simply, well, as John Hurst would, uh, expl has explained many times, it's, uh, Magna Carta was a peace treaty, so basically what Magna Carta represents is, is a list of the grievances, the list, a list of the areas of the Constitution which were being undermined by King John, and therefore these were the particular areas that, that they felt needed to be addressed. Now, the fundamental part of our Constitution, as far as I'm concerned, is the fact that, of course, uh, we are given unlimited, inalienable, God-given rights, and they are perceived to come from God, not from man. And we'll come on to that in a second. Um, so, Magna Carta then, sealed in 12, 1215, uh, and uh, 
this is the 800th anniversary. It is being used absolutely as an opportunity to replace um, what was done in that day and what has happened for a thousand, well, you know, 800 years ago wasn't the start of it. That was actually a continuation of something that happened earlier. So in fact, our constitution probably is, what, 1,200 years old, John? Um, research research pushing back to 2,500 BC. That's my position. Okay. Well, the same goes uh, for the Bill of Rights, another restatement of principles. And in this case, of course, uh, it was uh, trying to, well, this was an, uh, a condition of, uh, that, that is a picture of the Bill of Rights from, from Parliament, by the way. I hope, hope you can see it okay. But anyway, that, that, the Bill of Rights was, was effectively uh, uh, the conditions by which uh, William of Orange was allowed to take the throne at that time. Now, um, con contrary to common belief, as I've said, we don't, believe in a uh, we don't live in a democracy. We live in a constitutional monarchy, and perhaps uh, we need to address that problem. Um, so before I go any further, how many people in here actually support the royal family? No, 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 right, okay, so this is an important point and, and one of the things that needs to be made because we've got to separate the, the, the idea of the monarchy from the person who sits in the office, right? And so, so it's very easy to say that because a particular monarch isn't a good monarch that we throw out the monarchy as a whole and in fact that removes one of the protections that we have um, because as we'll come on to uh, the, the, the uh, coronation oath provides that it's basically their job specification and they have a particular role to play uh, which is relevant to our protection more than anything else. So um, monarchy is under our current constitution a fundamental part of government uh, and uh, you know when we talk about government of course we're not talking about people ruling us and telling us what to do. That's not what government is supposed to be. Uh, they're supposed to be our public servants, aren't they? We're supposed to tell them what to do. And they're supposed to represent our interests, and that's not what's happening. They're representing business interests, corporate interests, or they're representing their own interests. They're rarely representing our interests, but that's our fault. So looking through history, uh, we have always had, uh, there have, there's always been a nasty element of work within this country, uh, but there have been uh, two or three, maybe, maybe a few more, depending on your point of view, decent monarchs in their time. So let's, uh, let's talk about a couple of them. The guy on the left is Edward III. Now, he wasn't that great a monarch, but he did one thing that I, that I kind of respected, although he probably did it for his own interests. Uh, and that was that uh, he basically bankrupted the financial system that was in existence at the time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a fan of his for that reason alone. <laughs> now, uh, it's, it's interesting that, that uh, when, you, when you look at the evil that's operating in the world uh, historically, what you tend to find is, is a, uh, a maritime trading organization linked to the banking system. And they're not separate. So in the 14th century, when Edward III was on the throne, he took a big loan from these Florence, Florentine bankers, uh, the Bardi family and, and the, uh, I can't remember the other one, begins with P, it's gone for the moment. Uh, and the, the, this was known, by the way, as the Lombard banking system. And if you look in the city of London, you'll find all kinds of references to the Lombard banking system, Lombard Street, and, and it, it, the Ulster Bank used to be the Lombard and Ulster Bank and so on. So they're still, they still hark back to the great days of the Venetian Empire. Um, and uh, so uh, Edward III basically refused to pay back a loan that he'd taken. And that started, that started the collapse of the banking system. But it's quite interesting to look at, at how they behaved in those days, um, because they used the same old tactics. Um, they would, they, 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 the, the, the Venetians uh, sent Marco Polo off to uh, China, for example, and they, they were really tr trying to, to, to uh, uh, asset strip the Chinese at the time. So what they would do is they would, one day they would go to the Chinese and, and others and they would say, um, guys, the only kind of money we're accepting today is gold. And then tomorrow they would say, sorry guys, gold's no good anymore, we don't like it, so we're only going to accept silver. And so gold would suddenly become worthless and, and silver was the trading currency. And so, so they were manipulating currencies in this way. And it's pretty much the same model the IMF uses in Africa, isn't it? They, they say, you want to build that bridge? No problem. We'll lend you all this money. Here's the money. It's in your currency, but you've got to pay it back in dollars. 
And so, of course, what they then do is they put, put conditionalities on it and they say, uh, well, you've you got to pay it back in dollars, but, but you've got to also implement these economic policies. And what those economic policies do is they devalue the local currency against the dollars so that they can never actually pay back the debt in dollars. And this is the same kind of stuff that the, the Lombard banking system was doing with the Chinese and others. And, and you've got to say the only thing that changes is the date. <laughs> so Edward refused to pay his debts. And, uh, and actually, I, I, I believe that from that time, and this might sound, sound over conspiratorial, but from that time, I believe that there was a determination within the banking families to destroy this country. And so what we ended up having was that those same bank, that same banking oligarchy effectively moved from Venice through uh, Holland to Britain so that by 1694, when our friendly Scottish bankers set up the Bank of England, in fact, the power behind that was the same banking families that were running the Lombard system in the 14th century. So it took them 300 years to do it. And since they've come to the, taken over the city of London, they've, they've, they're systematically destroying this, this country, particularly in the last hundred years or so. Right, probably the monarch that, uh, oh, right, sorry, that's something, sorry, I'll go back to that. Yes, the second monarch here, uh, Henry VII, he's probably responsible for actually creating this country as, as a nation, as a proper nation. So during, under the Plantagenets, you know, this country was kind of uh, pretty, pretty lawless. Uh, they, were, they were at each other, the barons in particular were at each, at each other's throats all the time. Henry VII uh, took over the throne. And, uh, and really started developing the country. He developed the economy, he encouraged education, he was uh, developing the arts. And to be honest, you know, Shakespeare and Marlowe could not have happened if, if Henry VII hadn't been the king. Um, he, he stopped working with the barons and he started working with the House of Commons in order to develop the country. Uh, and he, all, the, all the statutes that he created in that time with government that had economic effect. He benefited, and none of his closest advisors benefited from that at all. So it was, he was doing it for the general welfare rather than for people, rather, for, rather than for himself. Um, and the other thing that he did um, was he set up the Star Chamber. Now this is, the term Star Chamber has become uh, a real dirty word among anybody that has any uh, understanding of the law in recent, uh, you know, for good reason, but actually when it was operating under Henry VII's reign, it was being used as a court that individuals could go to and they heard hundreds of cases and so on and they were generally cases where people were being evicted from their land by wealthy landowners and they were generally, uh, the landowners were generally found against. Now unfortunately the Star Chamber, which was working well under Henry VII, when Henry VII died, Cardinal Wolsey took it over and he turned it into the real hellish thing that it became. So, but he was probably one of the, he, he demonstrates that it is possible to have a monarch that actually does things for the benefit of inhabitants of the country rather than for uh, the, the money to late. And the other one, Queen Anne here, um, she of course became queen after uh, William and Mary. There was a massive faction fight within uh, her government uh, between the Duke, Duke of Marlborough, the first Churchill, uh, and of course he was pro the bankers, uh, and there, was, there were a group of people around Queen Anne that were trying to uh, stop the bankers getting control in the 17th century, the 18th century. Um, and uh, some people say that perhaps her death was not natural. Um, I don't know whether there's any, any truth to that. Um, she's probably, I think she's the last monarch, is this right, John? She's the last monarch that withheld the royal assent. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, one, um, did ever but in okay. So what's clear is that the present monarch is not doing a good job. Anybody disagree with that? No, okay. Uh, <laughs> she's permitting our political class on behalf of their corporate masters uh, to ride roughshod over everybody else. Um, and I'm going to give one, an example of that in a minute. But before I do, I'd just like to draw your attention to probably the, yes, the most important uh, constitutional document we have, and that's the Coronation Oath Act, because this is the monarch's job spec. Uh, and what it says here is uh, that basically 
It's, it's a freely taken, a mutual covenant between the monarch and the people of Britain. And uh, during the coronation ceremony, um, there is this notion that we elect our monarch. And it's kind of a sort of speak now or forever hold your peace kind of election. Um, you get the opportunity to say something at the time of the coronation. And, uh, and I think John said in the past that basically there's a guy, there's a guy in armor, an old guy in armor comes in, waves a sword, and you get the opportunity to ask, invite him outside for a punch up. And, and, and whoever wins the punch up decides who becomes the, it's a, it's a bit archaic perhaps, but nonetheless, there is this notion that the monarch is elected at that point. Um, and in return for that, the monarch swears the coronation oath. Um, and uh, so in the case of Elizabeth II, what, what was said was uh, the Archbishop said, will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the peoples of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, blah, 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 uh, to, uh, to, according to the respective laws and customs? And she said, I solemnly promise to do so. And then the Archbishop said, will you to your power cause law and justice and mercy to be executed in all your judgments? And she said, I will. And to that I say, Melanie Shaw. It's interesting that six monarchs have been deposed in one form or other, uh, having been deselected for their failure to maintain the rights and liberties of the people. So there was Ethelred, uh, Richard II, Henry VI, Charles I. They cut his head off. James II and Edward VIII, well, that was slightly different, but nonetheless, six have been gotten rid of. It's not impossible to get rid of a monarch. Um, and perhaps we should consider it. I'm not convinced that, that anybody that's actually in line for succession at the moment is any better equipped to provide a, to do a good job than this one. But nonetheless, we've always, always got to keep in mind it's our job to make sure that people do their jobs. And this, I think, you know, this was something that... that uh, at, how many people here were at Birkenhead for the... Uh, right, so quite, quite a few people were at Birkenhead. The people outside the courtroom when the judge was being arrested, when the police were stopping people from getting into the courtroom, there was this uh, chant came, created, out of nothing, do your jobs. And I think this is a mantra that we, hashtag do your job, I think should be a, something, if we all use Twitter, that's something that should be, uh, should be used. But here's an example of uh, a massive act of constitutional treason. And I have to thank Kay, who's in the room somewhere for this because she pointed us at this, this diatribe here. This is a Criminal Justice and Courts Act 2015. It's been given the Royal Assent about two weeks ago. It is a disgraceful piece of legislation. But of course, what did the mainstream media do? Well, they, they decided that the, the only thing they would focus on was, was uh, um, revenge porn, because there's a clause in this that says it's now, an unlawful, it's now illegal to put revenge porn up, well that's fair enough. So they focus on something which everybody's going to agree is probably a good thing and they ignore a lot of the other stuff that's in here. So we've got to remember what the Queen swore at her coronation that she would uphold the laws and customs of this country and she would, uh, she would use all her power to cause law, justice and in mercy to be executed in all her judgments. Well, every judgment's done in her name so let's have a look at this. This is what it says in the uh, fact sheet for, for one section, just one section of this. It says, the government believes it is unacceptable that valuable time in magistrates' courtrooms is taken up by offences such as speeding, driving without insurance and TV license evasion, when very often defendants do not attend hearings, meaning only magistrates, prosecutors and court staff do. This is disproportionate, expensive and wasteful when compared to the seriousness of the offence and the likely penalty for the defendant. It also takes, uh, it also takes valuable uh, magistrate resources away from dealing with more serious offences, such as those we, uh, which have biggest impact on communities. So basically what they've done is they've created uh, something called a written charge, uh, which means that uh, unless you actively uh, declare that you want to go to court to, to, to plead not guilty, then this will happen as a purely paper exercise probably happen in the North, Northampton Bulk Processing Centre or something. A purely paper exercise, you cannot attend court and give any oral evidence. So there's no mitigation possible here. You can either go and plead not guilty, but if you're, if you're, if you're basically want to say, well, I'm guilty because it happened, but, I, but these are the circumstances, and perhaps you want to reduce the sentence, that doesn't seem to be possible anymore. 
And the other thing is it's happening in a closed court, so you can't, you can't see justice being done, right? It gets better. There's, we haven't even scratched, well, Kay may have done more, but we haven't scratched the surface of this document yet. But there's another thing. Because it starts talking about uh, Section 21 creates an offence of ill treatment or willful neglect, care worker offence. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but ill treatment of someone, that's harm. And that's covered by common law, right? So what they've done here, they've created this new offence, ill treatment or willfully to neglect an individual as a care worker. So that sounds good. But hold on a second. Section 22, care worker offence excluded care providers. A local authority in England is not a care provider for the purposes of Section 21, which is the offence, to the extent that it carries out functions to which Chapter 4, Part 8 of the Education and Inspections Act 2008 applies. So let's go and look at that and see what that is. It says that, so, that, so in other words, a local authority is not a care provider for the purposes of this offence if the local authority uh, if the functions conferred on the authority under Part 1 of the Children's Act, Child Care Act apply, if the functions conferred or exercisable by the authority in their capacity as a local education authority, if the functions conferred on the authority under Sections 10, 12, 17 and 19 of the Children's Act, the social services functions within the local authority, uh, whether or not uh, functions conferred or exercisable uh, by the authority under the Children's Act, the Adoption Aspects Act, the Adoption and Children Act. A person is not a care provider for the purposes of Section 21 to the extent that the person carries out a function of a local authority in England mentioned in sex, subsection 1, blah, 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 blah. Uh, right, it goes on to talk about social services. And then it goes on to say that a body corporate, which is subcontracted to a local authority to provide these, they're also, not, they're also exempt from this crime. So what they've done is they've taken a common law crime, which applies to everybody, and they've now limited it to certain circumstances. And this queen has signed off this, this act. Treason is exactly right. So children in council care and so future Melanie Shaws of this world are still going to be unprotected. And in fact, they've, they've now legislated to make them unprotected. Okay, well, let's just quickly run through the, some of the major uh, sort of constitutional reform things that have happened in the, since 1900. So the Parliament Act in 1911 removed the right of veto from the Lords accept the bills uh, to extend the life of Parliament. So uh, no more right of veto for the Lords. I'm sure John could say more about this. 1949, Parliament Act further reduces the House of Lords. 1958, Life Peerages Act, so more attack on the House of Lords. 1972, well, that's the European Communities Act, treason. 1997, referenda in Scotland and Wales for de devolution. Uh, 1998, Human Rights Act. 1999, House of Lords again. 2005, Con Constitutional Reform Act. Uh, that included reform of the role of the Lord Chancellor, establishing a Lord Speaker in the House of Lords, creation of a Supreme Court, another attack on the House of Lords. Uh, 2011, Fixed Term Parliaments Act. Uh, and so that means that uh, it, the, the royal prerogative to dissolve Parliament is gone. So it becomes much more difficult to actually get rid of them once they're in. So what are the common themes? House of Lords reform is clearly a common theme. Uh, human rights, devolution, infringement of common law. So we'll, we'll run through these. House of Lords reform. House of Lords is a mess. We can all agree on that, I think. We've now got over 800 idiots in a room and they, they do nothing. Because what, what has effectively happened is that either, either you're a business placeman, you're there because you've, you've, you've contributed something to one of the political parties because you're, you're, and you're in big business, or you're ex-House of Commons. What is the point of being in the House of Commons? The House of Lords is there as one of the limitations on the House of Commons. What's the point of then putting people that have worked in the House of Commons in the House of Lords? 
So they're working for an elected House of Lords. So we're going to have the same whipping system in the House of Lords as we have in the House of Commons. So where's the limitation on stupid government, on out-of-control government? There is none. And this, but this, this House of Lords situation has manufactured this mess. Um, so uh, it, it's been a created thing. Uh, now, it's true that Nick Clegg wasn't able to get all his uh, reforms through in 2011. Uh, I, think, I think that's only a temporary delay. Uh, the policy is still there for an elected upper chamber. Uh, now, I was in a pub one day with an ex-colleague who's from South Africa, and so he's looking at what's going on in this country from somebody that wasn't born here. Uh, and he's saying, you know, they should never have got... This was in about 2008, so it was long after they got rid of the hereditaries, and he's saying they should never have got rid of the hereditary peers. And this is somebody that's looking from the outside, as I say, and, and, he, and I said, well, why do you say that? And he said, uh, well, they were the only people that were even trying to prevent all this... Uh, removal of privacy, for example. He just gave one example. The, 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 the con to continuing infringement of our rights, the Lords were the only people actually delaying that or stopping it. And uh, so, you know, the, the, the presentation in the media that the, that the, that the hereditary peers were, were born with silver spoons in their mouths, that they weren't working for, for the, the best interests of, of, of the... Uh, of the country actually hasn't necessarily been, I mean, they don't get it right, they didn't get it right all the time by any means, but, but it isn't borne out by the, by the history of the thing and the situation since Tony Blair put through that legislation, uh, it, it's, the situation is a hundred times worse. Right, human rights. This, this human rights law is exactly like that legislation I showed you at the minute, uh, a moment ago. In this country, we have the notion, constitutionally, the notion of God-given rights. It's important that the, that the rights come from God because they're not coming from, from another human being, another human being who themselves would like to be viewed as God, right? So, because that's how our leadership would like to be viewed. And, and the idea is that they're inalienable and unlimited. And the only time that there are any limitations on a, right, on a rights constitutionally is when our rights infringe on somebody else's. And that's why we have so murder, for example, or theft, or that's why we have law. Um, so human rights is a problem because it comes from the opposite standpoint. It's saying you have no rights except for the rights that we give you. And so, that, so this, human, this European human rights legislation that, that has been shoehorned in over the top of our constitution um, actually puts us in a really dangerous position. It's not about rights at all. It's about removing rights, and it's exactly the same strategy that, was, that I've just highlighted in that, in that other legislation a moment ago. So, uh, you know, I have to say there, there are a lot of people in the activist community that, that, that rely or, or go running to, to Europe, to the Court of Human Rights or to human rights legislation whenever they're not getting their way with regard to peaceful protest and all this kind of thing. And I think that's a pretty dangerous thing to do because we've got to, we've got to, maintain, we've got to uh, go to the Constitution first and not go running to, to Europe. What we do when we run to Europe is to give validity to that, that way of doing things. And this does not fit with our legal system, with our Constitution. Right, next, of course, um, we have devolution. Now, where do we start with this? Devolution is uh, simply divide and conquer. Uh, divide the UK into its constituent parts and divide England into regions. And in fact, devolution in Scotland, to my, David may disagree, but to my mind, independence was never on the table because there was never any discussion of Scotland becoming an independent sovereign nation state. It was going to transfer potentially from being part of the United Kingdom to being part of the European Union. Uh, and actually, it, it confused me for a while why it was that David Cameron, who I know wants to split this country up into as many small pieces as he can, why he was arguing for, staying, for, for Scotland staying within the Union, because I don't think he's a unionist at all. And of course, Scotland has been the guinea pig for much of the really nasty legislation that has been coming through in the last 20 years. So they've now got their new, shiny, unified police force that is Police Scotland. So you don't have any Strathclyde police or any, Clydes, uh, any uh, Galloway police anymore 
It's Police Scotland, one Chief Constable. Who, who investigates corruption within the police force in Scotland? Because you can't ask some, a Chief Constable in another uh, constabulary to investigate one. So, so that's, that's pretty clearly not a great idea. But Scotland is the guinea pig for just about everything nasty. We've got the, uh, the social workers assigned to every child from now, you know, from the, from the date that they're born from now on, and so on. Conceived. Conce yeah, yes, conceived even, not even from when they're born, that's right. Now, and this is an, another example of it. We're now starting to see devolution being ruled out in Britain. In England, sorry. So it's not just the, it's not just Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland that are getting their own governments. We're now creating city states, and we're starting with the National Health Service. So we're going to devolve the NHS to Greater Manchester. It was amazing. Uh, I'll come on to it in a second, but it was it was pretty amazing, just how Cameron is determined to push this through at a pace which is pretty impossible to fight against because it's going so fast. You blink, and another city has, has got devolved powers, and before you know it that we are going to be creating literally city-states. And then there was this. Did, has, anybody, has, have you see, has everybody seen the article in the UK column newspaper about this? This is, this is a disgrace. Uh, this is uh, Levison that they've ruled out. If you, everybody remember that Levison was the guy that was uh, trying to shut down the press in this country. Uh, and he's been ruled out now to, uh, well, Review of efficiency in criminal proceedings. What is it, what is it he's doing? He's, he is, first of all, suggesting that uh, Skype is a good mechanism for, uh, for taking evidence in courts. Uh, he's doing a whole bunch of stuff on the basis of austerity. But chapter 10 of this review talks about juries. And that's, that is the dangerous bit, isn't it? Because that's really what, uh, what he is aiming for, is to get rid of, uh, get rid of juries. Reviewing the rules of parliamentary privilege this is just one of the sort of mi minor constitutional reform th things that are on the agenda at the moment. Uh, and another one, the recall of MPs. Uh, this uh, agenda to recall MPs, of course, is, is about uh, people being able to deselect their MP through misconduct. But it's interesting that it's still the case that unless an MP is convicted of a crime that has a custodial sentence of one year or more, they cannot be sacked. Right? Shoplifting, it's not important enough. You know, you know, expenses fraud doesn't matter unless you're convicted. This, this, was, this was staggering. This, Cameron came out the day, after the, uh, the day of the, uh, the Scottish uh, referendum result. And uh, this is what he had to say. The people of Scotland have spoken. It's a clear result. They have kept... Our country of four nations together, like millions of other people, I am delighted. As I said during the campaign, it would have broken my heart to see our United Kingdom come to an end. And that's his emphasis, not mine. Our United... Who's our? Who's us? It's not me, I'm pretty sure, but he's not talking about us. Yeah. So now it's time for our United Kingdom to come together and move forward. A vital part of that will be a balanced settlement Fair to people in Scotland and, importantly, to everyone in England, Wales and Northern Ireland as well. I'm a passionate believer in our United Kingdom. I, w I want more than anything for our United Kingdom to stay together, but I'm also a Democrat. So I want our country to stay together, but I'm a Democrat. We now have a chance, a great opportunity to change the way the people are governed and change it for the better. Better for whom? He never says. It's absolutely right that a new, a new and fair settlement for Scotland should be accompanied by a new and fair settlement that applies to all parts of our United Kingdom. So just as Scotland will vote separately in the Scottish Parliament on their issues of tax, spending and welfare, so too in England, as well as Wales and Northern Ireland, should be able to vote on these issues. Uh, and all this must take place in tandem with and at the same place, pace as the settlement for Scotland. So he's putting a timetable on it. And uh, be, he won't, it won't be sitting still long enough for the flies to settle. The, it does stink, though. I hope that it's going to take place on a cross-party basis. 
well, we're now in, well, we're about to be in a rainbow coalition, I believe. So I think that's going to happen. I've asked William Haig to draw up these plans. He's the right man for the job. <laughs> we'll set up a cabinet committee right away, and proposals will also be made to the same timetable. I hope the Labour Party and other parties will contribute. It is also important we have a wider civic engagement. So here's the third sector coming in, the, the NGOs, the charities, the common purpose. So it, it is also important we have a wider civic engagement about to improve governance in our United Kingdom, including how to empower our great cities. And we shall say more about this in the coming days, and indeed they have. So who's driving this rubbish? Let's have a look and see. Local Gov, well, William Hague, of course, but there's, there's a combination of individuals and organisations driving this agenda. So we've got Hague, and he's on the Local Gov website because they're pushing it. We've got Devolution Matters pushing it. Sorry about the slides, the, the, the screen resolution isn't, has uh, screwed things up a little bit. Uh, Nick Clegg, of course, well, he, when he, in 2010, when he became uh, Lord president of the Privy. Uh, he then, uh, unelected of course, president of the Privy Council. Uh, he was also put in charge of constitutional reform. He didn't have a huge amount of success. He got some things through, but they're still plowing ahead with it. BBC, of course, promoting it like crazy. Uh, local government organization, uh, Nick Golding, pushing it like crazy. And of course, they are pushing any opportunity for regionalization, so where there's a bit of angst in Cornwall about whether they want to be part of England or not, they, they absolutely push that um, and, uh, and try to inspire uh, a sort of popular uprising against remaining part of, the uh, part of England and part of the United Kingdom. Uh, the ecologist, who are they there? One of the, what do they say there? Setting environmental agenda can't see the date, since 1920-something. Right, so they're setting the environmental agenda. Do you think they're behind the global warming scum? But they're also setting the constitutional reform agenda, or at least they're trying to. And uh, sorry, can somebody remind me this guy's name? Because he's so... Yeah, yeah, sorry, he's just so innocuous. I just, I just can't... Yeah, Chris Grayling, right. So a British Bill of Rights. We already have... They keep talking about us needing a British Bill of Rights, but we already have a Bill of Bill of Rights, we've had one since 1689. So why do we need a British Bill of Rights? What they're talking about is a British Bill of Human Rights, because they want human rights legislation. Unlock Democracy, a big, a big organization pushing this agenda. Uh, we have the Electoral Reform Society pushing it, we have the British Youth Council pushing it, and of course we have the uh, Constitutional Reform Committee within Parliament pushing it. And they have been running a major consultation on a new Magna Carta because we've got to throw out the old one. It's not fit for purpose anymore. We've got to get rid of it and get something new. So who's on that? Well, there's, there's a list of thugs. Graham Allen, Jeremy Brown, Chris Chope, Tracy Crouch, and so on, Paul Flynn. It's a mixture of, uh, from multiple parties, so it's all parties doing this. But the main man uh, is uh, Graham Allen. Get Carter, he says. We need to get rid of the Magna Carta. Now, he's written some books. He, he wrote one called Reinventing Democracy. He, strangely enough, he's Labour MP, but he wrote a book called Good Parents, Great Kids, Better Citizens uh, with Ian Duncan Smith. What does Ian Duncan Smith know about any of this stuff? <laughs> and then this one. So he wrote this book, The Last Prime Minister, uh, and he's been campaigning for years that the prime minister role should be an elected presidential type of role and not uh, you know, a separate election, separate from the general election. So that's why uh, on the front page of the uh, UK column we said uh, Nick Clegg uh, is new prime minister president. That wasn't a typo. It was kind of hinting at that. Uh, and, uh, and then we got this clown here, Conor Geerty. He's, he's Irish. He's not British. What's he, what's he pushing a British constitutional reform agenda for? And he's uh, London School of Economics, uh, Matrix Chambers, you know, so you can imagine what he is. 
so what happens when you try to hack the, con the Constitution? There's an article about that in the paper as well. If you haven't got one, pick one up. And that's, that's what he looks like. Now, what he's, what he's wanting to do is to crowdsource the Constitution. So bearing in mind what I said right at the beginning about the fact that because our Constitution is complex, it's difficult for the general public, unless they've got a particular interest in it and want to go and research it and read it about it for themselves, it's difficult for the general public to know what, what they would be giving away in the event that a new Constitution was brought in. But he wants to crowdsource the Constitution. So what are we going to end up with? It's, 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 you know, there's no, there's no, so all these people, all these organizations pushing for constitutional reform, that's on one side of the scales. Who's on the other side? Well, at the moment, I can't think of anybody else, really, that other than the British Constitution Group. And so we need everybody in this room that isn't a member of the British Constitution Group to be one or to get involved. I don't think it really matters if it's involved with the BCG directly, but getting involved in the type of campaigns that we're running. In fact, you're here is, is a great start to that. Now, uh, of course, let's quote Ian Crane for a second because it's right. Apathy kills. And we've got to somehow encourage people out there to drop this apathy that they demonstrate regularly. And I keep banging on about this one. I've got to say it again. He is silent, is taken to agree. We've got to, we got to start getting the bullhorns out and the megaphones and shouting about this stuff and not being afraid to, to, to get out on the streets and hand out leaflets or whatever it happens to be. We've got to try, try to, to get the message out on, on, a, on a wider basis because if they get their constitutional reform agenda through, they will, we will lose common law. And, and it, is, it is a pretty, I believe common law is probably a unique legal system. I don't know whether it's a... I don't know whether it existed before at any time in ancient history. I don't think it has. But if we lose it, we lose something really significant. So, as I say, join the BCG or the UK column if you, if you wish. Um, I'm just going to run through a couple of suggestions here. If you find that when you're talking about these subjects or any subjects that are interested, interesting to you, that you're getting a, a brick wall coming up between you and the people that you're speaking to, sorry, um, why not uh, go and speak to some of the local campaign groups on completely unrelated subjects? And one of the things that's happened with the uh, with response, uh, you find that, that there's quite a lot of people that are involved with the anti-fracking campaigns at, at response events. For example, Beat the Bailiffs and so on. And that's quite an interesting dynamic that's happening, is that people that are campaigning on different subjects are starting to get together because they're recognizing a con common enemy. Um, so if you're getting a brick wall coming up on, uh, when you're talking to people in the street, why not go and speak, speak to people that are running campaigns on single issues and try to get them aware of the Constitution and perhaps some of the constitutional remedies that they might have that they haven't considered before? We've got an election coming up. We've got to get to every hustings meeting, I believe, that we can and ask some hard questions about what's going on here. Not just about this, but also about the financial system and a, about evictions and a host of other things. I, th I think in the run-up to the election, we should, we should be just basically trying to embarrass the, the candidates as much as possible. Promote the British Declaration of Independence. We had, uh, um, that was mentioned. If, if, you're, if you get on the BCG website, you can see Rock, Rodney Atkinson's talk from the last conference. And he talks about the, the, the British Declaration of Independence. And this is basically an attempt to get uh, uh, MP, uh, prospective MPs to sign up to certain principles before the election. Uh, uh, read it. It's, 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 uh, it's important. Justin's going to be talking about flying columns later on, so I'll leave him to do that. Uh, and get involved with response and get out of debt free. They're speaking to the get out of free, debt free guys are speaking tomorrow. Uh, and, and Guy Taylor will be speaking tomorrow. But here's the key thing. We, where, if, if we get any criticism for the daily news program that we produce, is that we're concentrating on, uh, we're, you know, we're analyzing the news and therefore we're generally analyzing bad news. And so the programs tend to be all about all the rubbish that's going on in the world. There are people, many of you in many cases, that are doing some really fantastic work out and about campaigning on various issues. 
And we would very much like to be promoting the stuff that you guys are doing much more than we are already. Um, and so I'm just going to say, close by saying, whatever you're doing, tell us about it and let us, because the fact that you guys, that people are doing things inspires other people to do things and it becomes an exponential effect. We've got to promote as much the, of the good news as we do of the bad news. So the bad news is important because if you don't know what they're doing, you don't know what you've got to fight. But we want to actually promote some of the good news as well. So please let us know when you've got an event on. Let us know afterwards how it went. Send us some video footage. Get some interviews. Let us know and we'll put it out. And that's me. Come back on, Mike. Sorry, we, we, we need you here. Right. Tea and coffee will not be served until 11.45. I know you're desperate for tea, teas and coffees, but it means we have a Q&A session with Mike. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> so we have, we have 15 minutes with Mike. Um, another little announcement. Breakfast is from 7.30 a.m. in the morning, not 6.30 a.m. as advertised. Who gets up at 6.30 a.m. to have breakfast anyway? Um, and what else do I need to tell you? I think that's it. So question and answers. Who has a question? David. Am I wandering around with this then? Yeah. Uh, is this yes, going to be a hard question? No, this isn't. Well, we'll see. Uh, I asked a question of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service in Scotland. I asked them what the word Crown meant. They said, we do not hold that information, and under the Freedom of Information Scotland Act, cannot give you an answer. Can you do any better? Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I, th I think there's two answers to that question. One answer is the monarchy. That's one answer. It's not the only answer. Uh, and the monarchy... It's interesting because uh, Hansard has said something about this. They don't actually know whether, the, whether that part of the crown is a corporation soul or a corporation aggregate. They don't actually know what it is. That's what they say publicly anyway. So it's very hard to, to actually get to grips with what the crown is if, if the people that are supposed to know what it is don't actually know what it is. But if we assume that it's a corporation soul, then, then what you say is that, that you have a corporate body uh, which is set up like the churches used to do. Assets get passed along from generation to generation, so the person that occupies that office has access to various assets, and those pass each time there's, there's a, a change of, of monarch. Then there's the City of London, and that's another question. But, you know, how far do you want to go down that rabbit hole? Well... Again, it's very, very difficult to get actual evidence of what is going on. You look, you look at, uh, you look at it, it seems to be a, a template that they use. You look at uh, uh, various common law writs, for example. What they've done is they've created statutory writs with the same name and they've put them over the top and therefore you, it's very hard, it's very hard to, to actually uh, push a, a writ of mandamus into, into, into the courts anymore because they've created another if you go in and ask for the forms that, that you want to fill in, they, they give you the statutory forms and you can't get the, they can't get the common law version. And, and so I believe, that the, I believe, but it's only a belief based on what I've, the research that I've done, that, that, that there is this extra layer of the crown, which is, which is uh, City of London corporate. Uh, and uh, um, how, what, how, that is actually, how that is actually set up as a legal organization. I have no idea, and I think it's very hard to, to, to find out because unless you're a member of the club, perhaps, you don't get access to that information. It's just not public. As I say, Hansard, Hansard it's been discussed in, 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 in the Commons what is the nature of the crown, and they say that the, 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 the government, relevant government minister at the time said he basically hadn't got a clue. So. Personally, I think the common law has got to be the, our answer to 
our problems. And I, tr and I tried to uh, open up a common law court, got into trouble over that, but I'd then gone through to the Queen's Bench Division, and of course they keep trying to put me on to the admin side. So what I did, I then put a freedom of information request in, and they've t uh, the Ministry of Justice have told me to uh, refer me to Lord Leveson's uh, how to go use the Queen's Bench, but he only used it as the three dip uh, uh, administrative law divisions, yeah. and he doesn't mention the common law division. Uh, Master Leslie at the Royal Courts of Justice hides behind the staff, so you can't get through there. Uh, Carl Lentz last year went to the, tried to open up the common law. He was successful a year previously, but he was blocked. That's all gone quiet. But what I would like to, I suggest that if at 30 people, knowledgeable people, went to the Royal Courts of Justice, walked in through the door as a member of the public, once they're in there, they sit down, and one of them asks for the duty judge. He's supposed to be there 24-7, uh, 365. And uh, that, as long as Russia Today and Al Jazeera were primed that it was going to happen, it certainly would create publicity. And it, better still, it would, if we could have a common law court, because each of us there have been caused harm because we've lost our sovereignty. So I'd like your comments on that, please. Well, I mean, I think that's a very good idea. Uh, and I mean, what, what you've just expressed is exactly what we're talking about here. You've got the, the common law situation and they put the statutory situation over the top of it with the same name. And, and then you, you don't get access to, to what's underneath. And I think that, that would be a, I think we should uh, talk about that. Can that I just say, Bally Man is in the traders area with his own Queen's Bench there, if anyone wants to go and uh, ask him some questions. Oh, thank you. Um, you. You asked us a question a little earlier on, which you didn't get an answer off me because I didn't understand the question too well. And it was about the monarchy and whether we supported the monarchy. And I didn't understand whether you were saying, do we support the institution of the monarchy or the idea of a monarch or the current lot? Now, I don't want to get your head chopped off, but I just wonder what your ideas are on that. Well, no, that, but what I was asking was who supports the Queen? And, of course, that was the point I was trying to get to. We, we have to separate the person that occupies the office from the office. And so I'm here, standing here saying, you know, I think we need to hold on to the monarchy, but we need a better incumbent, and we need somebody that is. And the problem is, for example, uh, you know, the, the 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 grandchildren of the current monarch have been trained by Florence of Arabia. Who everybody know who Florence is, right? So Flor Florence of Arabia, who's got their constitutional training. Uh, sorry, Florence of Arabia gave constitutional training to William and Harry. So really. What hope have we in that family? Because they haven't, had the, they haven't had the proper constitutional training that they need to do the job. But uh, you know, I'll, I'm gonna keep, keep coming back to this point. It's our responsibility to make sure that they do their job. And that means we support them when they do something that's right. And it means that we withdraw our support and, and actually be more active about making sure they do their job. We've gotta hold them to account. And, uh, and there's, there's a lot of different ways we can do that. But, but we've got to actually be active in doing that. I mean, the whole point of having government is so that we don't have to manage the country ourselves. So we, we elect representatives to do that for us. But we still, so instead of maybe spending 80% of our time actually managing the country and managing our, own, our, our infrastructure around us, we're giving that, somebody else the job to do that. So the problem is that most of us are spending 0% of our time actually getting involved in that. And, and of course, they, they, they make sure that they that they are corrupt enough and that, that, that the media uh, makes us cynical enough that we don't want to get involved in the political process in this country. And that's, it's understandable that people don't want to get involved, but unless we can convince people to get involved and stop being apathetic to what's going on, and actually, criminal of, MP commits a criminal offence, they go to prison. Banker commits a criminal offence, they go to prison. There's no two ways about it. Queen or King commits a criminal offence, they go to prison. And, and we don't, we stop pussyfooting around these people and saying, oh, we'll, we'll just give you a slap on the wrist or we'll give you an uprated pension. I think if you were relating to the present, you'd probably get your head saved because yeah. she's abdicated. 
Well, uh, actually, uh, um, a couple of years ago, John uh, Galloway uh, gave a couple of talks asking the question at a previous BCG events, asking the question if, if she had accepted mediatization. Mediatization is, is retaining your style and title, so she stays as the queen, but you give away your, your constitutional role and constitutional powers. And, uh, and we suspect that, that may be the case, but of course if she's done that, she's done it after she took her coronation oath. And so she's, she's, she's in breach of her own oath of office uh, and that's a criminal offence. Is she being blackmailed? There's quite possible that she's being blackmailed, but it, you know, this comes back to what Ian, Ian Paddock was talking about earlier, because you know, it doesn't matter if you're being blackmailed. It doesn't matter if you're getting pressure from your colleagues. If you're seeing wrongdoing being done, you've got to stand up and say, this is wrong, and it's got to stop. Absolutely. We've got two, two last people. One. Following on quite closely from that, Mike, um, it took an unprecedented 16 months between Queen Elizabeth II's accession and her coronation oath. Now, Greg Hallett, the late New Zealand campaigner, is one who suggested that during that period, people around the Duke of Edinburgh were priming the Queen for what she should say in her coronation oath, or rather priming the text. Is there any source that anyone in the room knows of that can clearly put side by side the difference between George VI coronation oath and Elizabeth, that's pretty hard to look up. Uh, well, it, it is there. It is there to be found, uh, and and it's a good point. So, so the cor the actual document that she signed. If you look at previous coronation oath documents, as with any contract, it's supposed to be signed at the bottom, because you stand under. You're you're signing that you're standing under the words of the of the oath, and it appears that her oath, she has signed at the top of the page and there's a purple piece of purple ribbon between her signature and the, and the text of the oath. But that's one thing. She still stood up in the Westminster Abbey, if that's where it was, apologies. <laughs> uh, she still stood up and swore before God and, and the people that that was what she was gonna do. So, and it was, it's, not like, it's not like it happened in secret, it was on television, so, so she can't get away from that. She can't pretend that she hasn't done it. She did. It was there for everybody to see. Yeah, well, yeah, possibly in some. Amnesia, corporate amnesia. Hello. It, Hello. This is all new to me, so forgive me if I don't quite know the, the, the format. But if all these institutions in England, etc., etc., are actually registered or limited companies, etc., can't we actually complain or make official complaints against the directors at Companies House to get them struck off for fraudulent trading if they're breaking all these rules? And secondly, can we perhaps have a... Um, a common law court on a boat so that we are not actually on the land. Would that in any effect work? Well, I don't know the answer to the second part of that, but of course the, the answer to the first part of that is just what we've said already. It, there are a hundred different ways to, to, to deal with these problems, but it relies on people power basically. So we, we've got to, yeah, we've got to, we've got to be active. So that means doing more than, than, than we are at the moment. And that's, that's the point. We've got to hold them to account. Nobody else is going to do it. You don't sound very new to it. Very good questions. Um, it is tea and coffee time, so you can all rush to get your teas and coffees. And we will be back to talk about the Bradbury. Have fun.